Hey, this is Kenny Brooks, funny salesman, and I just jumped off the porch with dirty glove bastards. All right, so we got the one and only Kenny Brooks jumping off the porch with us today. Welcome, man. What's up? Yeah. Pleasure to be here, man. Nah, no yes, problem. Sir. Appreciate you swinging by today, too, man. Thank you, my brother. Yes. So how you feeling today, man? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Yes, sir. Just got to <laughs> Atlanta, man. I had a flight. Got canceled because of the snow blizzard in Detroit. So oh, then really? I just drove here. So, yeah. Oh, you drove here? Yeah. Ooh. Nothing beat a failure unless you try. So I just <laughs> jump on that highway. <laughs> for how, sure. How long is that drive? Like 10 it hours? It was like 10 hours, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Small thing to a giant. I feel that, man. So yes, what brings sir. you to Atlanta, man? What else you got working on? Um, I just interviews and skits and stuff. I just did a Cam Newton one. Okay. Yeah, and I got 85 go? South after this year. So. Yeah. No, it was lit. It was yeah. lit. Yeah. Did you ever think you would be getting interviewed by Cam Newton? I still I trip know. out that he's got his own podcast. Yeah, man. no, it was it was fire. I wouldn't have never thought, though, nah. Yeah, nah, that's what's good, man. Yeah. All right, so let's dive into your story, man. So you're from Detroit, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so for folks that don't know, like tell them what side of the town you're from. Where, where yeah, I'm you? from the east side, seven miles. I was born in Southwest, and then, like, as a kid, my mom migrated to like different neighborhoods of the east side. I went to, um, I moved to like the east side, like Warren and um, Warren and like Connors, I mean Warren and like uh, Cashew between like uh, on Haverhill. So I grew up on Haverhill, went to like Jackson Middle School, then went to like Finney High School my freshman year. Then I moved again to like Seven Mile. That's like one mile from Eight Mile. Everybody know Eight Mile because yeah. of Eminem, the movie. But I moved to like Seven Mile East Side, like um, in Orleans by like the Quinder and Ryan, and then went to Persian. Then I uh, moved again because I got kicked out of that school. Then I moved to like the West Side, and then I went to like Detroit F City High School. Oh wow! Yeah, so I was like moving back and forth. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What'd you get kicked out of school for? Man, you know, being a class clown, that's how I became like a comedian. And so I developed that at a young age. You know, I was always roasting people in school. Then I was like, I wasn't really going to school a lot. I was skipping school a lot, <laughs> like huh. being like, yeah, so. Yeah. Like, who were some of the comedians you looked up to back then that kind of, you know, m might have inspired you then? Uh, like Bernie Mac, uh, Eddie Murphy, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey was like one of my favorite comedians from like In Living Color, oh, Fire yeah. Marshal Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the whole Wayne and family, you know what I'm saying? Marlon, Damon, you know, Keenan, all of them. But Jamie Foxx, okay. uh, a lot of them, like uh, Red Fox, Richard Pryor, yeah. um, Eddie Murphy, of course, um, Bernie Mac, Red Fox. It was a lot of them, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Chris Rock, Chris Tucker. Okay. Yeah. That was like during when I was coming up. Then when as I got older and I got into comedy, I started liking like the Kevin Hart's, the Mike Epps, you know okay. what I'm saying? The yeah. new, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. So did you ever imagine, you know, that comedy would be able to take you so far in your life right now? No. Uh, like I transitioned from a salesman to yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So no, I never, you know what I mean? Not in a million years I would have ever thought that it would have came to this. Yeah. So how'd you get into sales at first? Um, so like at 12 years old, I got introduced because um, my mom couldn't afford me no basketball shoes at the time. Huh. And I had grew like five or six inches. I was like five foot five, five, six at like 12 years old. So I was like pretty tall for a 12 year old. And I remember asking my mom, could she give me some like basketball shoes and she couldn't afford it. So I still went to school and tried out for basketball. And I remember, I don't even know what kind of shoes I had on. I, I thought they were some slip and slide records by a trick dad, you know what I'm saying? Cause I was sliding out of the, you know, gym into the lunchroom. Like I was getting humiliated. People was talking about me. And I told myself like this, the brokers I'm ever be. So I remember coming home from school and I seen like a, a a letter on a telephone pole saying that you can make like $50 a week uh, doing this door-to-door -door job as a paper boy, you know what I'm saying? So I called the number, of course, they hired me the next day, so I was working from like four to six at the school, like delivering Detroit oh, wow. News and Free Press, yeah. And one day we knocked on this dude's door and he was like, he just cussed us out. Like, cause we was, we didn't work like Detroit, of course, you know what I'm saying? Cause like, they didn't let us work that. that cause they, they, it's they, a little rough. Yeah, they like, you probably get robbed, all type of crazy <laughs> stuff going on. So we was working like the suburbs of Detroit, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So it was predominantly white folks, you know what I'm saying? So, but we was working like the rich white people. And then me and my coworker was black and we ended up knocking on 
the guy door delivering a paper and he came and cussed us out. So the first thing we thought of was like he was racist, you know what I'm saying? Because we was black, he, you know what I'm saying? And then my friend was trying to fight him. And then I told him, I was like, no, I got this. So I asked him, so I was like, sir, can I ask you a question? He was like, what? I was like, you got kids? He was like, yeah. I was like, say two of your kids was playing and one broke the glass. You want to spank both of them, right? He was like, no. I was like, well, you shouldn't spank us for the bad performance. Let me just call my stupid advisor. And he started busting out laughing. Then we end up upgrading him like Beyonce. So he ended up getting like a whole year subscription for like cussing us out. And then my coworker went and told the manager and the manager made me a salesperson. Oh, wow. So I went from making like $50 a week on a salary, like working from four to six, you know what I'm saying? No matter how many hours you work, you was getting $50, you know what I'm saying? Cause that yeah. was your salary. I went from doing that to becoming a salesperson where I worked off commission, you know what I'm saying? And I remember it like yesterday, I remember when I first signed up for it, my mom was like, you ain't about to knock on nobody door. You think you about to knock on stranger door? They just snatch you inside their house. And then when she saw my first check, I made like 550 bucks. She's like, keep oh. doing it, keep doing it. Oh, you know wow. what I'm saying? <laughs> so she went from like being paranoid, not work, want me knocking on doors to, had like told me to keep doing it, you feel me? So anyway, to make a long story short, that's when I found out at 12 years old, like I would never punch a clock unless I swung on Flavor Flav. Cause I was like, I seen the uh, benefits of, you know what I'm saying? A salesperson besides actors and entertainers, the highest paid people in the world with sales people. Cause yeah. I learned like confidence and you know what I'm saying? How to be a people person, how to break the ice with people, making them laugh. And then I developed that at 12 years old. So mm -hmm. fast forward to like, when I turned 18, my grandmother had passed away and she like really like raised me with my mom. And when she passed away, I was like 18. I was like a senior in high school and I was like 6'4", like the height I am not. And I dropped out my senior year. And I remember my mom told me like if I didn't get a job or go back to school, she was putting me out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So she put me out at the age of 18. And then that's when I um, took the traveling door to door job, like okay. selling a cleaner product where I okay. went viral. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But um yeah, I did that from like 18, then I went viral like in 2010. I was like 24, 25. Yeah, before like even being viral was a thing. Yeah, <laughs> when I went viral, the only people was viral was like Soulja Boy and like uh, <laughs> Justin Bieber. This was like before Vine and everything. You yeah, know this saying? only Twitter was around. Yeah, Twitter exactly. And it wasn't even Instagram, none of that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It was MySpace was still out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so it was crazy. Yeah. So yeah, like. I went, I, like I said, I, I went viral like on an accident because like I didn't go viral because somebody, I knocked on somebody's door and it was like, oh, this dude funny, let me record you. I actually knocked on a lady door and she thought I was breaking in people's houses. And she really? came to the door with That's a That's why she started recording I swear to God, it? yeah, true story. And what's crazy, people, they probably seen my original video that went viral like back in the day, but they don't know that I had got kidnapped by Indians to selling Jamie Foxx to going viral, you know what I'm saying? That all happened within like a two month span. Holy you know? cow. Yeah. So. so first off, where did, where did this gift of gab come from, man? Like, have you always been like a slick talker or? Yeah, it was just like, a, uh, I, it's really a gift. Like I, I grew up listening to like Lil Wayne and Eminem and Jay-Z, okay. that was my top rappers. And I like how they put words together and that inspired me to put words together as a, com a, com a comedian way, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, especially in, the, in sales, cause like, like one of my favorite books that I had bought like at the age of 12 was um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then I started just buying books and getting educated on how sales work. You know what I'm saying? Like one, another one of my favorite books was Think and Grow Rich by, I mean, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And he said, mm -hmm. if you want to gather the honey, don't kick over the beehive. So I knew right then and there, if I wanted to win, I had to do stuff that people weren't doing to win. You know what I'm saying? I had to be like, number one, different. I had to sell myself and I'm not a prostitute. So I had to get them to love me first. You know what I'm saying? So that came with like breaking the ice and just, I started writing down jokes. I had like 10 notebooks full of one-liners. You know what I'm saying? That okay. I had different icebreakers. You know what I mean? When someone came to the door, like not even, had no attentions on buying from me, you know what I'm saying? So they looked at me first as a comedian than a salesman, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I'm gonna just pay for the show. I had so many people <laughs> told me, I don't even care what you're selling. You made my day, how much is it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause that's when I knew I was, you know, doing the right thing like Spike Lee, cause they wasn't even looking at me as a salesperson. Yeah, how does that make you feel when people tell you like, man, you made my day? Just by, yeah. you know, running into a stranger. Yeah, just no, it was a him. blessing. That's why I say that's like a super gift, you know what I mean? Where you can knock on a stranger door and they'll know you from a can of paint and then they give you their precious commodity. And then once they, you leave their doorstep, they be like, thanks for coming by <laughs> after they gave you their money. You know what I'm saying? It felt like good. So. Yeah. 
So you go viral. Do, are you even aware that you go viral? No, that's what's crazy. So I went viral in 2010. I didn't find out till like 2017. 2017? Yeah, like seven years later. What's wow. crazy <laughs> is that, like I said, when I went viral, I didn't know nothing about social media because I didn't have social media. When I went viral, they had like Nextels and Blackberries and stuff like that. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I think they had probably like an iPhone 1, probably yeah. iPhone 2. I don't even remember. But I know I didn't have access to like phone and technology like how it is now. You know what I'm saying? So I'm still knocking on people's doors and they taking pictures like, oh, I just saw you on YouTube. I'm like, what the hell is YouTube? You know what I'm saying? For real? They I didn't really know. You, you know what I'm saying? They was taking pictures and then they buy my product. So I'm like, dang, OK, she saw me on YouTube. I, this was an easy sale. You know what I'm saying? I did not know that I had millions of views that I could to like monetized off of you know what i'm saying yeah. i didn't find that out till like 2017 and how i found out is that that show ridiculousness mm -hmm. they had emailed the company and they was like they wanted to pay me to come on a show so i end up calling like the producers of the show and they told me that the lady that uploaded the video they paid her like 20 bands oh wow to copyright to buy the copyrights for the video yeah, you know like license it yeah. yeah and they only wanted to pay me like 150 bucks to come on the show <laughs> with like two people That's so it's like we can up. give you two free tickets and you and the two guests can come out and we can pay you 150 bucks pitch in the hotel and you explain how the video happened. I'm like, what? I said, no, nah, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, y'all gonna pay me 150 bucks for pay this, you know what I mean? And at the time I had like four or five kids, you know? So I was like, oh, wow. that's crazy. So come to find out, I ended up getting in contact with the lady and that's when I found out this video had like over 300 million views on YouTube. Oh so this lady made like over 800K off that one video. What? And I ain't get a dollar, so that's when I got She didn't break you off nothing? She man, hell, that's what really pissed me off. Oh, I could imagine, man, yeah. I hit her up like, dang, you supposed to break bread like the last Yeah, supper, let's 50-50. You know? like, yeah, then. like, you, like, come on now, like, yeah. So anyway, I ended up giving me a lawyer, I tried to sue her end up finding out that I couldn't because in the video they showed me where I gave her the consent like in the video she was like can I put this on YouTube I was like yeah so by oh, me saying damn, that just the that, verbal agreement yeah. that let that that gave her you know what I'm saying the rights, rights to yeah. you know what I mean do whatever she wanted to do with the video so she got mad and called me and was like you know what I can't believe you went behind my back you could have talked to me one-on-one -on -one. you gonna try to sue me how about I just take the video down and she took the whole video down at the time the video was going so viral it was like a hundred different copies oh yeah it's you know everywhere everyone's it was, uploaded it, it. yeah everybody was uploading so like right now it's still like five or six or seven because she deleted it in like 2017 that's oh, when wow. I started my YouTube channel and then I got into like social media and started you know what I mean monetizing and everything but yeah, that, it was crazy. Like. Oh, that's crazy. But it, what's even crazier, you said you were kidnapped by Indians? Yeah. Like, Tell like me this story, man. Yeah, so. So, like, I was a top salesperson for the company for, like, five years. Like, when I came in, I came in, like, straight, like, beating all the salespeople. You know what I'm saying? I was a new man, and I was, like, I came in rolling like eyeballs, just, you know, beating everybody, just, you know, catching on fast because I had experience when I was like 12 years old, you know what I'm saying, from selling newspapers. So anyway, make a long story short, I was like the top salesperson for like five years straight. I won like sales another week, sales another month, sales another year. And then this one day, this dude named Chris, he ended up uh, working an Indian reservation and he ended up beating me this day. You feel me? So he started talking crazy to me like, yeah, I finally beat the go to sales. Kenny Brooks, I finally beat him. So he started talking crazy. So in a meeting, I raised my hand and I was like, I got a $500 bet. I bet 500 bucks that I go work the same neighborhood Chris work and I double the sales, you know what I'm saying? So the owner took the bet. So they dropped me off in the same neighborhood. Come to find out, it was like a murder in that neighborhood. Like California, like big on gangs and stuff. And I remember like yesterday, I had worked this uh, Indian reservation. Uh, and the first door I knocked on, the dude was washing his cart. And I would like, he had a gate, so I wiggled the fence because we trained to like, don't walk through nobody's gate because mm -hmm. they can have dogs or they can just shoot you on sight for like trespassing, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I wiggled the gate and stuff and he was playing music, but he was washing his car, he had his music blasting. So I'm yelling like, hello, you, you know what I'm saying? And he finally turned the music on. He's like, get off my porch before I blow your head off. He said, get off my property or some crazy stuff. And I was like, all right, God bless you. We're going to see you around like a donut. So I started walking off. He's like, oh, you think this is a game? Like, because I had cracked like a little joke. But I didn't know that he was going to get mad off me saying that. You know what I'm saying? He's like, you think this is a game? And he went in his car and grabbed the gun. And he started following me. You know what I'm saying? I'm already like in the middle of the street, not walking. Yeah. So he walking with a gun. You know what I'm saying? So I jumped on the phone and called my manager. I was like, look, 
I don't know, where you just dropped me off at, but this dude following me with a gun, you gotta come get me. And my manager started laughing. He was like, wait, you were just selling all these wolf tickets in a meeting. He was like, you know, if I come get you, then you forfeit that bet and you lost because you just told the owner that you had a $500 bet, you was gonna work the same neighborhood. He was like, ain't you from Detroit? I'm like, bro, that don't mean nothing. <laughs> and then he was like, well, I'm like 15 minutes away because I'm in traffic right now, dropping off the rest of your team. He was like, look, when you get off the phone with me, if he's still following you, just call the police. So I hung up, I turned around, dude must have thought I was on the phone with the police, so he started walking back towards his house, you know okay. what I'm saying? So I started walking in the middle of the street, I see this cool school on the left hand side, so I started walking towards the school because I seen like little kids out playing and I started using my street smarts. I'm like, let me walk towards the school because if he tries something, he ain't about to try to shoot me in front of no kids, yeah. you feel me? So I started walking towards the school and this lady happened to open her door, as soon as she seen me, she hurry up and close the door. So I ran towards her house and I knocked on her door. She had one of those screens off Friday, you know, like, you know that movie Friday mm -hmm. where they got the black screens in California where you yeah. could see, they could see you, but you can't see inside their house. Mm -hmm. So I banged on the door and then um, she opened the door. She was like, how can I help you? I was like, don't shoot, just a chocolate kid working hard. She was like, is you dark chocolate or light chocolate? I'm like, what the hell, this is a chocolate competition? I was like, I'm dark chocolate. She was like, you like African American? I was like, yes, ma'am. She was like, oh my God, what are you doing in this neighborhood? She was like, I'm surprised one of my nephews ain't ran into you because they, um, they dead, which is my brother, just got murdered by an African-American gang. She was like, you oh, wow. do not supposed to be in this neighborhood. She was like, I don't know what you doing. And I was like, well, I'm sorry to hear that. She was like, what are you doing out here? And I was like, I thought you never had. I was like, you see this spot right here? They call me Wild Earth looking for dirt. And then she was like, wait, wait, you trying to sell me something? I was like, yes, ma'am, I'm selling this cleaner product. It clean everything, said bad credit. So anyway, she was like, come in. She let me in her house. Come to find out the lady was blind. She had like a little stick. She was like trying to find her steps and stuff. So I'm like, oh, shoot. So she let me in her house and she was like, um, she was like, wait, so you selling a cleaning product? I was like, yes, ma'am. She was like, how, ma how much is it and how many bottles you got on? I was like, it's 40 bucks. She was like, I'm gonna buy all them bottles in your bag. She was like, on one occasion. I was like, what's that? She was like, if you call someone to tell them to come get you right now, cause I don't want nothing to happen to you. I was like, sure. So she bought my four bottles and I called my manager. You know what I'm saying? Cause he said he was gonna be there in like 15 minutes. I'm like, look, this lady just bought all my product and I explained to him like, look, I told you it was some crazy stuff going on. She just told me that her brother got murdered like a day before yesterday, a couple of days ago. And it, it's been like a war over here with like blacks and Indians. You got to come get me right now. He was like, I'm in the neighborhood, where you at? So I came outside, I see the van, the van like with that table at, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Soon as I come off of her porch, like five four wheelers just cut me off and like surrounded me. And a dude jumped off the four-wheeler and he pulled a gun out, put it in my, he was like, didn't I tell you to get off my neighborhood? He was like, my brother about to pull up in a brown native pride truck. If you don't get in, I'm gonna blow your head off. Soon as he said that, bro, my manager left me. Like he just took off in the van and left me. Oh, so wow. I just started crying. I was like, I ain't know what was gonna happen. The brown truck pulled up, dude rolled down the window. He's like, get in right now before I blow your head off. So I'm walking up to the truck about to get in because I ain't know what else to do, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then an unmarked police car happened to come out of nowhere and like rescue me. And like when he drove up, like they, they, so we, uh, Indian reservation remind me of like the hood. Cause they got like, it's like boarded up houses. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like banding houses and diapers and stuff like pit bulls and stuff. <laughs> it just remind me of like, you know, like the hood. So anyway, they start going through ditches, you know what I'm saying? Cause this they neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? As Soon as the police came and got me, like he drove straight up to me. They just start, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like going through ditches. So he called his dispatcher, like called back up and they had helicopters and backup police is oh, wow. there, but like this happened at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. They didn't catch these dudes till like eight o'clock at night, you feel me? So they took sure. me to the police station. I had to do a police report. And then right after that, you know what I'm saying? They end up bringing like four or five guys in like at eight o'clock at night, you know what I'm saying? So they had me like in this, uh, this black room where like I could see them, but they couldn't see mm -hmm. me. I had to do like a standing lineup. I felt like six nine before six nine. I had to point people out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And then I had pointed out like two of the dudes. I pointed out the dude that uh, told me to get in the truck and the one dude that was following me with the gun. Hmm. So they end up releasing me and then my manager end up pick it, picking me up, you know what I'm saying? Like eight or nine hours later. So wow. soon as they picked me up, man, the whole Detroit came out of me. I snapped, I was like ready to fight my manager and everything. I was like, I can't believe you left me out here. You know what I'm saying? For a bottle of cleaner, like you seen what was going on, I told you, and you just left me here for dead, you know what I'm saying? And I've been like the top sales. So I just went out, I was like, I quit, y'all gotta get me back to Detroit, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, they end up uh flying me back to Detroit. This happened like in um like 
November of like 2009, okay. that incident happened. So like Thanksgiving happened, Christmas happened, New Year's happened, now it's February, you know what I'm saying? I get a subpoena where I gotta fly back to California to testify against these dudes that I, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. said that tried to attempt to kidnap me, you feel me? So anyway, uh, they picked me up from the airport. It was crazy, I knew it was real because as soon as I got off the plane and got my luggage, as soon as I'm leaving baggage claim, this dude with a suit on holding the sign that said Kenny Brooks, I'm like, what the hell? I felt like President Obama. I'm like, dang, they had me in a bulletproof like uh, Tahoe and stuff, like, oh, and wow. they escorted me like in the middle of nowhere, you know what I'm saying? Like I was in a desert in LA, you know what I'm saying? And my court was like downtown LA, you feel me? So they picked me up like Sunday night and I had court early in the morning that Monday morning, you know what I'm saying, like at eight o'clock. So they end up uh, picking me up um, taking me to a hotel, then they had got me up early in the morning to go eat breakfast, and then they ended up taking me to court. So we went through the metal detector and everything. So on my way up, we went on the elevator. As soon as I get off, I had to use a restroom. So it was one guy standing right here and another guy standing right here to like watch me, you know what I'm saying, while I go in the restroom. As soon as I walk in the restroom, this Indian dude walking out, he was like, hey, you motherfucker, and he went like this. And I just took off and ran out of the restroom and I yelled like, hey, this dude trying to kill me. And I just ran, you know what I'm saying? And I kept running and I ran past the two dudes that were sitting right here. They still were standing there, bro. I ran straight past them, ran past the um, elevator and I ran to the exit stairs and just kept running. And I ran out of the uh, courtroom and I just kept running. I seen like a gas station. So I ran behind the gas station and I'm banging on the door, kicking, um, kicking the door for help. And then a dude came out, taking out the trash. I was like, please, I need to use your phone. I need you to call the police. Somebody, uh, somebody trying to kill me. And he went and grabbed the phone and then they called the police. Like 10 minutes go by, nobody ain't come. So I actually used the phone again. So I ended up calling my mom to try to get me back to Detroit because I was yeah. like, damn, they're stranded in LA, you feel me? <laughs> so anyway, she was like, you know, I ain't got no money. She was like, you in California, right? She was like, that ain't that company you was working for? They still in California. You should contact them. You, they, you've been a top salesperson for like five years. Maybe they'll get you back home. So anyway, I ended up calling the um, company that I quit, you know what I'm saying? The sales company. So um, I talked to like the manager that I cussed out prior mm -hmm. to that, you know what I'm saying? I was like, look, I'm stranded in California. Look, I know that uh, I quit. I need y'all to help me out right now because you know, I'm stranded. Like I, whatever y'all need me to do, I do it. And they, they was like, all right, let me call you back. So they called the owner, then they called me back in like two minutes. And then he was like, look, the, I just talked to the owner. The owner said we can do one of two things. He was like, he said, we can come get you right now. He just looked up you a Greyhound ticket. It's like 280 bucks. We'll pay for that and we'll drop you off at the Greyhound. The only thing is that your Greyhound bus don't leave until like eight o'clock at night and it's like eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, so wow. I had to wait like 12 hours. He's like, or option two, we can come get you right now. We'll drop you off in a nice, safe neighborhood. You will just have to knock and because we found you a flight too, but it leave at six o'clock. You would knock until like three or four. We could pick you up and we could use the rest of your commission to pay for half of your ticket because we just looked up the flight to get from California back to Detroit and it was like 600 bucks and we would pay half of it. You could pay the other half with your commission. So at first I was like, man, I ain't knocking on nothing for y'all dudes. You know what I'm saying? Y'all just like, I'm in this situation because of y'all, you know what I'm saying? So then I thought about it. I was like, but I'm not about to wait in no Greyhound for like 12 hours and they already know how I look. They probably follow me there. You know what I'm saying? So I thought about it. I was like, look, no guts, no glory. I was like, look, just come get me. I just work in the neighborhood. So they end up dropping me off in like Tarzana, California. It was like the uppity neighborhood, like in the valley where like a lot of the um, middle class rich people stay at. So I'm knocking for like an hour or two and I'd have knocked on like 10, 15 doors and they all slamming the door in my face and I'm going through it, you know what I'm saying? Cause I don't got selling on my mind. I got yeah. all of this stuff that's been going on for the last couple months. It just keep on lingering in my head. So I get on the corner and I'm about to quit, but I'm crying and I just start praying. And then the next door I knock on this dude, like this old white cool dude come to the door, like super down there. He's like, man, what y'all here selling? I was like, I thought you never asked. So I started cleaning uh, his concrete. He was like, look, he was like, do it clean hard water? I was like, am I black? <laughs> then he was like, yeah. So he's like, if it clean this hard water from my shower, I'm gonna buy. So he take me inside of his house and he got pictures of like Shaq, Kobe, Nick Van Axel, oh, Kareem, wow. Magic Johnson. He got pictures of like all the Lakers. I was like, what you do for a living? He was like, he was a doctor for the Lakers like when they get injured. Hmm. He was like, you ever thought about doing stand-up comedy? He's like, you know Jamie Foxx there across the street, right? I'm like, what? So I, I ran over to Jamie Foxx's house, but he had like a gate, you feel me? I couldn't even see his house. So I pressed the buzzer and then it just started ringing and nobody answered. So I go to the next house. The next house I go to, that was the people that recorded me, the lady, 
okay. than where I went viral, you know what I'm saying? So as I'm going to her house, I see a brown two-tone Maybach pulling in the gate, you feel me? Mm -hmm. So I run back over to the gate. But Jamie Foxx had one of those sensor gates, like it was closing, but once my body got close, the gate started opening back up. So I'm walking into this dude's house, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm about to sell Jamie Foxx. Next thing I know, his camera started turning towards me, and <laughs> he started talking on the intercom. He was like, wait, wait, what are you doing? No trespassing, get out of here, I'm about to call the police. I was like, COD, he was like, all right, one second. He was like, bag up. So I bagged up and he closed the gate and he drove in and it's Maybach and he pulled back up like on a golf cart, you know what I'm saying? So as he driving up, I'm looking, I'm like, dang, it's really Jamie Foxx. So he seen my spray bottle like hanging off my hip. And it, when he got like real close, he was like, wait, wait, you trying to sell me something? I thought you said COD. I was like, yeah, come on down. <laughs> and then he was like, wait, not only is you funny, you funny looking. And then he started talking about my teeth. He was like, boy, with a grill like that, I bet you you sneeze, you could bite a hole in your chest. And then I started cooking him. I was like, boy, all that money you got them little ass earrings, your earrings look like sugar. And then he started laughing. He was like, you know what? I like you. You remind me of myself when I was younger. Because he told me, he just told me to get in on, like, on the passenger side of his golf cart. And then mm -hmm. he just gave me a whole tour of his crib and told me how he used to be a shoe salesman, how he got adopted from this small town to real Texas. Oh, and wow. his real name ain't Jamie. He used that name to do like open mics because they used to always pick females over the guys like when he used to go to open mics. He just told me his whole life story. And he was like, man, I'm telling you right now, you special. Like, don't give up, whatever you do. And remember that movie, The Django? Mm -hmm. He, he was filming Django at the time. That's how okay. long ago I went viral, you know what I'm saying? So he ended up buying a bottle and then he sent me on my way and then the next door I went to, that's where that video happened. As soon as wow. I knocked on the door, she opened it with a camcorder and I was like, I'm gonna be quick like Nestle, beat it like Michael Jackson. That's why your neighbors <laughs> remind me of Nicolas Cage. I'm going to 60 seconds and the rest was history. Yeah, that's, man, yeah. you can turn that into a movie right there. I know, that's what I'm working <laughs> on right now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So when do you get your first chance to do stand up then? Um, I started doing stand up like in 2019. Okay. 2020, yeah. Like three, like three. I took it serious like in 2019, 2020. I started doing like open mics at Marty's and um, Laugh Factory. You know, I started going all over LA doing stand up. Yeah. yeah. So, how did you adjust to stand up compared to sales? Was it easy transition for no, you? It was for you? super hard because the difference with sales is that I feed off of people's energy and off of their conversation. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Off a of stand up, you just sitting there while everybody quiet and you know what I'm saying, either they gonna boo you or they gonna heck you gonna get hecklers, you know what I'm saying? And if you're not really funny, see the I was just telling um Cam that in the other interview, like the hardest thing about stand up comedy is when you're doing open mics with other comedians. Cause the other comedians ain't gonna really laugh at you. Yeah. Unless you like a Kevin Hart or you already got a name, you know what I'm saying? Big, cause they gonna feel like if I laugh at this dude and he an amateur like me, then I'm giving him the recognition that he funnier than me. You know what I'm saying? It's like a, it's like a pride and a confidence thing. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So that was like the hardest thing. The easiest part about stand up comedy is when you get booked for like shows and you get a real audience like my, yourself, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People that don't really like know my jokes or know, you know what I'm saying? And then you just make them laugh and they pay, you know, they pay to go see you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, that was the only thing that transitioned, but no, stand up comedy super lit. Okay. Yeah. How often are you doing shows right now? Uh, I haven't had a show in like six months. I, last show I had was with Brandon T. Jackson in Detroit at Punchline. Okay. Yeah, it was lit. Who's got the toughest crowds? Is it Detroit or yeah, LA? Yeah, Detroit, super, I ain't gonna lie, Detroit, <laughs> man, it's like, you gotta get on stage with a bulletproof vest. <laughs> I swear to God, if you're not funny, they're going to shoot you. No, I'm just kidding. But no, they, 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 I'm telling you, they, they don't play no games. Uh, I funny. hear the same thing about the crowds here in Atlanta. Yeah. They, they really tough. I, and it's crazy. I did, I did do a show out here in Atlanta, too. I forgot what was the name of it. It was like, uh, damn. No, I, like, I like Atlanta, too. They, they, they cool. Yeah. They, they, they weren't tough. They was laughing, though. Really? Yeah, okay. I swear to God. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I didn't, like, I didn't did, like, for like, four or five states. I did, uh... Cali, Detroit, I did Atlanta, I did um, Ohio, and I did Colorado. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but like out of all of them, Cal um, Detroit was number one. Yeah. And then Cali was like number two. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Um, so you've been building up your social media presence here, yeah. though, man. You've been going viral like every yeah. day, every other day or no, something right now. trying to go but, crazy, yeah. Yeah. So what's yeah. it like working with these other influencers on, on like social media? I know it's a blessing, man. Like shout out to Timberland because I feel like if I never probably work with Timberland, Timberland yeah. was like that next co-signer for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like when I started working with Timberland, then everybody started reaching out. You feel me? Like um, 
Yeah, like a lot of people. Like even like Detroit rappers, you know what I'm saying? Like I was a lot, I'm a fan of like my city, you know what I'm saying? So I always wanted to work like with like the Sada Babies and yeah. the Baby Trons and Baby Money and you know what I'm saying? Like the local rappers that like, that, that's lingering in, in the city and they, they blowing up, you know what I'm saying? But then when I started like going crazy, then they started reaching out to me, you know what I'm saying? Even like like other, like like Ray J all the way to Damian Lillard to, you know what I'm saying? Like bigger names, you know what I'm saying? Like me and Ray J and um, Dame Lillard, we got some cooking this summer, so. Okay, that's yeah, big but it's right all there. over, you know what I'm saying? That Timberland, we did about five, six videos for like TikTok and Instagram, it blew up and then people started reaching out, you know what I'm saying? Wow. So. Yeah, I just saw the video you and Jack Funny did. Yeah, man. yeah, me and him just we went crazy. Yeah, that was shout out to Jack Funny. That's my guy. Yeah, we just yeah, yeah. that just happened like last week. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, I saw this story you had uh, shared um, where you, I guess you're doing door to door sales, and this lady was like on the verge of committing suicide. Yeah. Could you share that story with us? Yeah, that man. So um, I'm writing a TV show right now called Door to Door Chronicles. You know what I'm saying? And um. One of my episodes is called Suicide, you know what I mean? And like um, one of my favorite books, like I was talking about earlier, is that by um, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. You know what I'm saying? Because you never know what someone going through, yeah. you know what I mean? And like, I felt like I had to share this story because there's so much mental health going on in the world, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people dealing with like mental illness and, you know, fighting temptations and they don't know how to deal with they self, you know what I mean? When they going through that, you know, them phases, you know what I'm saying? And I was, I, one of my quotes I was saying that like, uh, if you put your problems on the table and somebody else put their problems on the table and you looked at their problems, you'll pick your problems up. You know what I'm saying? Because you making a permanent decision over a temporary problem. You might put your problems on the table like, dang, my girlfriend just cheated on me. And then this person put their problems on the table like, dang, I just went to the doctor and found out I had stage four cancer. The doctor said I got two weeks to live. You're going to pick your problems up like, damn, this ain't nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, someone else trash is someone else treasure. But yeah, it started in um, Metro, Oregon. So I, I was going door to door, of course, and um, Metro, Oregon, I love Metro, Oregon just because of the simple fact that they call it God's country because it rained a lot out there mm. and it's a green state, but it's a depressing state because it rains like all year round. A lot of people be like depressed, you know what I mean? Because mm. it, it ain't really like LA, like sunny, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, to make a long story short, I had my team with me, I had like four or five guys and they was like ready to give up because they was knocking in the rain and people weren't answering the doors and then when they was answering the door, they were slamming the door in their face, you know what I'm saying? So they came to me like, man, I don't know what it is, but we not getting no sales, can we go to the door with you so we can see what you're doing because you out here having fun in the rain and we out here about to give up, you know what I'm saying? I was like, come on, sure. So I took them to the doors, I had like five guys with me, so not the restaurant though, <laughs> but yeah, I had five guys with me and then I end up knocking on a lady door and she come out and just start snapping on us. Soon as she saw me and a guy, she was like, get off my property, whatever you're selling. I'm about to call the police. You do not, but she just snapped on us. You know what I'm saying? And I said like two or three things. I was like, well, I'm sorry to bother you, ma'am. Jesus didn't sell everybody. We're going to see you around like a donut. So before she closed the door, she was like, what did you say? I was like, well, I'm sorry to bother you. Jesus didn't sell everybody. We're going to see you around like a donut. And then she smiled and a tear dropped her eye. And she was like, you know what? She was like, you a Christian? I was like, yes, ma'am. She was like, I apologize for the way I came off at you. Today, just not my day. I wasn't looking to uh, buy anything from a salesperson. I just got some bad news that I just lost my son in a car accident. And I was like, well, I'm sorry to hear that moment of silence for your son. And we just like did a little, you know, like a moment of silence for it. You know what I'm saying? And then after we got done, we was really about to leave. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then she was like, so what are you out here doing? I was like, I thought you never asked. I was like, we were a youth program. We out here selling this cleaning product. I'm training these guys how to do the right thing like Spike Lee. Thanks for not biting my head off. And then she just started laughing. She was like, you know what? I like your attitude and you out here in the rain. She was like, um, do a clean carpet because I got this spot on my carpet. I was like, yes, ma'am. She was like, if it clean this spot off my carpet, I'm a boss. So she let us come in the house. As we walking in her house, I see she had a gun on the table. And I'm like, well, don't shoot, man. We just the good guys. She was like, no, 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 let me tell you, right before you knocked on my door, I got the bad news that my son died in a car accident and I was just about to blow my brains out. She was like, but by your spirit and your attitude, you just changed my whole like energy and everything. And she ended up buying a bottle and me and this lady still friends to this day. She got a real estate company doing good for herself. I ain't talked to her in like a, probably like a year or two. Last time I talked to her was like the end of 2021. Yeah. But it's just to show you that you never know what someone going to. What if I would have been a nasty salesperson with a bad attitude cause she snapped on me, you know what I'm saying? Two wrongs don't make a right. 
And yeah. just off of that, you know, I was able to uplift this lady and save the life, you know what I mean? So, yeah, like a real angel to her. Yeah, on God. Yeah. How do you remain so positive? You know, 2023, crazy shit's going man, on everywhere. When man. you've been through so much, man, you can't do nothing but look forward to happiness and po positivity, you know what I'm saying? I come from Detroit, Michigan, man. It's some people don't make it to the age of 21. My family used to tell me that, you know what I mean? Like, if you make it from Detroit, you can make it through anything, you know what I mean? I, I got the saying, I used to say, you know why black people don't play hockey? Because we already skating on thin ice. <laughs> so if you could just stay on the yellow brick road and stay positive, you know what I'm saying? Like, one of my favorite um, um, quotes is like, by uh, Bob Proctor, the um, law of attraction. He talk about how you manifest things. You know what I mean? Like, if you, whatever you're looking for, looking for you. Right next door to negativity is success. You know what I'm saying? Right next door to adversity is positivity. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. You know what I mean? Because you never know. Like, everybody go through something. It ain't what happened to you. It's how you handle it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, that's real. Yeah. Um, I see you be teaching sales, right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. what's, like, one of the main keys that, you know, these new salesmen lack? Confidence. Yeah, like, yeah, like um, confidence. That's what I, one of my main things that I teach people is how to be their self, you know what I mean? But I tell them like, uh, I can give you all the tools and I can give you the mastermind, I can give you what books to read, I can give you how to keep a positive mental attitude, but it's totally up to you at the end of the day to be successful in it, you know what I mean? Cause you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's crazy about sales is that I got my kids doing this, you know what I'm saying? My kids, they don't want for anything, but I'm teaching them responsibility at an early age because I was selling at 12 years old. So I got my kids at like 10, 11, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich, and they going out selling. And so if you're a grown person and I'm training you how to sell, I'm letting you know that even a dummy know to buckle up. If my kids can do this, anybody can do it. You know what I'm saying? Because we all put our pants on the same way. You know what I mean? Yeah. The only difference between me and that person that's not winning is our attitude. You know what I mean? Like Thomas Edison said, if you think you can, you right. If you think you can't, you still right because of your thoughts. You feel me? So. Nah, wise words right there, man. Yes, sir. So what's next for Kenny Brooks? Man, just, I got so much stuff going on. Like, Got TV shows coming out, documentaries, uh, a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, just a lot of grinding, you know what I mean? I can't really say too much because I got a lot of stuff that's, you know what I mean, that's coming out and like, but it's, it's about to be bigger than what Oprah used to be. 2023 about to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> nah, wishing you a lot of success too. And I appreciate it for yeah. sure. All right, you got any shout outs you'd like to give before you wrap it up here, Ken? Yeah, man. Shout out to um, my city, Detroit. Shout out to all the salespeople out there. Shout out to um, my, this is my brand too, Funny Salesman. It's about to drop in a couple of days. Uh, shout out to my mom, like for, you know, raising a, a, you know, a gentleman like myself. Shout out to my mentor, Mr. Davis. Shout out to my kids, my wife. You know, yeah. shout out to the whole social media, the ones that's out there that's, you know, getting that content done, because it ain't easy, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Being a content creator, they think it's easy. They see the views and they see the, you know what I'm saying, the likes and the comments and everything, but they don't know that, that you got to put in work. And you know, oh, yeah. I work eight days a week to get you to where I'm at today, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Guys, I am pissed around my neck, boy, I be clutching. Red, I keep 20 on the dash, I be stomping. My little bro been scamming all his life, like fuck the government. High as hell, crash the